My name is Brian. I'm going to tell you why I stopped going camping, although I live surrounded by mountains. You see, it used to be one of my favorite pastimes. Back when I was in college, a group of friends and I were going to do a documentary about life in the Appalachians. It was a big deal. It was for a grade that would ultimately pass or fail us. So, we didn't go into it lightly. We worked all spring and early summer advertising in the small mountain communities about the documentary. We collaborated and made lists of questions to ask each family we interviewed. And some of the families were willing to help us out. And then, well, of course, there were some who refused and told us to stay away from their places while we were filming. My family has lived in a small mountain town for several generations, so... I know how odd their view of the world can be. Also, I had big ideas, like the rest of the group, about being like the people back in the old days who traveled through the mountains collecting folk tales to share with the world. Except, we had GPS, audio recorders, cameras, and uh, uh, a jeep. The project, as we figured, would take us at least a couple of months to complete. That is, the house the house visits we would have to make. Now, compiling and editing, well, we knew that would take us right up to the deadline in the late fall. There would be some camping in the woods required, and we all loved the idea of roughing it for a while. Now, Kathy and Jenny would share a tent, and I would share with Rick. It would be a fun summer spent away from the hustle and bustle of our college lives. The week leading up to the beginning of our trip was full of chaos as we made lists of the items we would need and then we checked those lists countless times. We rented a Jeep Cherokee and packed that sucker to the brim with all of our things. The day we left the college and our lives for the past three and a half years behind, we were all ecstatic. And after getting lost twice on our way to the first little town, we realized that GPS wasn't always going to get us where we needed to be. And tired from the ride, we stopped at a convenience store and got out to stretch our legs. I bought a map used by the AT hikers in the area. It was weatherproof, and from the looks of forecasts for the next 10 days, it would have to be. Jenny was really the only one of us who had thought to bring a poncho and an umbrella. So the convenience store made a few more dollars from us as we bought several ponchos and two large umbrellas, the kind with the wide stripes of rainbow colors on them. We slept in a small hostel used by hikers that night. Admittedly, it was not the most pleasant experience. In fact, none of us slept. Some of the hikers looked like serial killers on the run, and others looked as though they might have been hiking the trail for a long time already. Uh, too long. They had a feral look in their eyes. But we were gone before sunrise, deciding that camping in the woods was preferable to another night in the hostel. That first two-week stint we spent going house to house was eye-opening for us. We had seen most of the houses and families before, but to visit them... To really sit down and get to know them, eat a meal and share stories with them. Well, that was different. Most of them were hard-working families, struggling to barely make ends meet. And they lived their lives close to the land, hunting, farming, canning, hauling water from wells. They seemed like an extension of the mountain, instead of completely separate beings from it. Kathy and Jenny, never having lived in the area had gone into the project with the preconception that people were poor, uneducated, and, well, backwards. And I found that their education were of a different kind, the kind that led to their survival in the mountains. Most of them were standoffish, but not backwards, as Kathy and Jenny had thought. And, well, poor? Ah. Uh, well, to the standards of urban life, I mean, I guess they were financially poor, but they were rich in other things like family, love, and acceptance. Things urbanites sometimes lack and don't even realize it. 
The third week, we left our jeep at the base of a mountain and gathered our gear. We would have to carry and pull our stuff to the next little community. It was going to be a two-day hike in. Then we'd hike back to our jeep. That was the plan. With all of our pre-planning and our lists, we couldn't have missed anything. We even had snake bite kits. We had thought of everything. The mountain at the time was in a beautiful bloom. The green was broken by shocks of colored flowers that grew in seemingly impossible places. A field of white yarrow came into view, and we stood transfixed by the sea of white blooms rippling in the breeze. It looked as if someone had made the field flat, and then planted the yarrow on purpose. There were no signs, no evidence of human interference, except that large square flat of land in the middle of the hilly mountain. After recording some footage and capturing still shots, we moved on. As the sun began to drop, we found a mostly flat area in a strand of new growth trees that would suffice as a campsite. Twilight turned to pitch black dark so fast that we were caught with only one tent fully set up. As we were clearing a place to lay a fire, I heard noises in the distance. It was laughter. Rick eased the handgun from his pack and stood next to me and the girls. None of us had mentioned a gun in our pre-planning, but consensus seemed to be a what-the-hell reaction. Rick looked at me and shrugged. You didn't really think I was going to come out here without some kind of protection, did you? The girls held out their thick walking sticks and I pulled out a pocket knife out and showed him. He scoffed. Yeah, that shit's no good if the other guys have guns, or... If a bear happens to show up, he shook his head and shushed us as the laughter and voices drew nearer. Flashlight beams bobbed, cutting through the darkness. There were three. As the three men walked into the woods about fifty feet from the edge of our sight, I yelled out to them to let them know we were here. Their sight was close to ours and we hadn't seen it when we were setting up. It was a father and his two teenage sons. They asked to enter our site and we let them. They helped us lay a fire and get the second tent up. They seemed friendly enough that we were at ease with their company. And they told us about their week-long camping trip, and we told them about our project. The two boys were unusually quiet for teenagers. The father rubbed his stubbled cheeks and looked troubled. I asked him what was wrong, and he looked at each of us in turn the firelight dancing across his stern features, highlighting the sunken look of his eyes and cheeks for the first time. Kathy moved closer to me, and Jenny, putting as much distance between her and the man as possible. The man said that we should change our route to the community. He said we should skirt the valley ahead, that it wasn't safe. Skirting the valley meant adding two days onto our trip that we had not packed for. He said that the valley caused people to go mad, get lost, and disappear forever. He told some more stories, outlandish tales of people murdering each other without realizing it, but I had already dismissed the warning as a scare tactic. He was just some guy out to scare the college kids. Kathy and Jenny hung on every word he said, though. I was glad when he finally left and went to his own campsite for the night. The girls were scared enough to want to skirt the valley. Rick and I would not budge from our route, though. And the next morning, we packed up. The whole time, I listened for the man and his sons, but I didn't hear anything. As we started our trek toward the valley, we veered off course just enough to see the neighboring campsite. The tattered remains of a tent that might have been new around 1950 flapped from a broken and rusted post. Debris had covered the fire pit many years ago. Yellow plastic ribbon fluttered in the breeze. It had been tied around a tree trunk, and it looked as if it might have been caution tape or the do-not-cross ribbon like the cops use at crime scenes. 
And I reminded the girls that we were there to document everything and told them to get the still shots of the abandoned site while Rick and I recorded video. I mean, sure, it was weird, but I thought the guys had probably camped a little farther away than we had originally thought. And they had most likely moved on before sunrise. We got back to our route and headed for the valley. And that's when everything went to hell. Literally. We spent the next two days trying to find that valley. It should have been an hour away from our camp. Our GPS didn't work, and our cell phones were absolutely useless. The map I had brought wasn't very useful either. None of the landmarks on the map existed where we were. Nearing the end of the second day, Kathy and Jenny were exhausted and they insisted we were being followed, although Rick and I never heard anything other than birds, squirrels, and the wind. We were all tired of trudging through the mountain, carrying our packs and dragging around the wheeled carts with our recording equipment. We were already into our food and water that was meant for the return journey. Rick suggested that we leave our equipment near a trail and walk ahead to find the place. We could travel faster without the extra baggage. So we covered the carts with ponchos and only took our backpacks. We set out on a straight north course. The course took us to our campsite from days earlier. Our tents were set up, the fire pit sat coldly in the center, and our equipment sat exactly where it had been. Kathy broke down and cried. Jenny followed suit not long after. As Rick and I tried to figure out this bizarre situation, I noticed small mounds of rocks set out at even intervals around the site. There was a small trail of blood from the fire pit to where I stood, and when I returned to Rick, he had his gun out, pointing it at something in the woods past me. Evil laughter echoed from no discernible direction. Something was out there, circling us. Kathy said it had to be the man and his sons, but I didn't think so. Man, this is too screwed up to even be real. We packed up and left here two days ago. Our stuff is sitting by the trail covered with ponchos. Rick was declining into a panic. And I tried to stay level. Listen, let's just start back out. I don't know what's going on. Let's just get the hell out of here. And so we tried walking south and ended up back at the site. We walked east and ended up back at the site. Whatever followed us in the woods still followed us, laughing, circling us. Each time we set out, the trips became shorter. When we set out to the west, we ended up back at the site in less than 20 minutes. By then, darkness was settling in. We were all in a panic mode by then. I walked the perimeter, kicking and scattering the little stone mounds. The others huddled near the fire. As I scattered the last mound, I heard Jenny telling Kathy that she couldn't sit out alone in the dark. Going back to the fire, I tried to talk Kathy down. She yanked her wrist away from me and stepped outside the perimeter that had been set with those little mounds. Immediately, her eyes rolled back, showing only the whites, and she passed out. We all gathered around her, trying to rouse her again. I turned to Rick and Jenny. Help me carry her back to the fire. And we all faced her again, and her face and head were covered in blood. Rick bellowed. What the hell, Jenny? Jenny held her walking stick. The end of it was bloody with bits of scalp and hair stuck to it. I looked back to Kathy, confused. I hadn't seen Jenny hit Kathy. How had I missed it? And before I could say anything, Rick pulled his gun and pointed it at Jenny. She dropped the stick and began backing away from us, shaking her head. As she backed away, she stumbled over a mound of stones, and I walked toward her, holding my hands out, and speaking the way one would speak to a scared child. Come on, Jenny. It's okay. 
to step back inside the circle. We're not going to hurt you. We're going to figure this all out. And all of a sudden, Jenny was propelled backwards as if someone had yanked a rope tied around her waist. She landed several feet away, just outside the light of the fire. Rick and I ran to her quickly and grabbed her and hauled her back to the fireside. And I saw that the mounds of stones had been replaced. Who the hell was doing that? There was a ragged wound in the center of Jenny's chest. She had been shot. She was dead. My heart nearly stopped as I stared at the wound. Rick, did you even hear a gunshot? And then laughter echoed around the site. I turned to Rick. He stood, pointing his gun at the moving sound that seemed to be circling us out there in the dark. I ducked to stay out of his way. I told him to put the gun down, but he wouldn't. And then it hit me. He had a gun. Jenny had been shot. I mean, it should have been obvious earlier, but I didn't see him shoot him. And then I yelled at him. Did you shoot Jenny, Rick? What the fuck is wrong with you? Put that thing down. But he wasn't hearing me. He just kept swinging it wildly in a circle, his eyes wild, his breathing erratic. He backed toward the edge of the circle, and he started to laugh maniacally and fired shots into the darkness beyond. And finally, I heard the dry click of the gun. He had run out of ammo. Standing up, I eyed him warily. He seemed calmer, and reaching toward him slowly, I took the gun and tossed it into the darkness. He kept laughing as tears streamed down his face, and I led him back towards the fire. Kathy and Jenny, well, they were gone. My blood froze instantly. I let go of Rick and stepped into the tents, looking inside as they were empty. I knew the girls hadn't gotten up and walked off. They were as dead as dead gets. But sure as shit, they were gone. A whisper, lightly veiled in the breeze, came to us. You're next. I screamed at the darkness. Show yourself. But my only answer was an icy gust of wind that nearly knocked me off my feet. Rick threw pieces of burning wood from the fire toward the perimeter. His words had disintegrated to gibberish, and I tossed flame and sticks towards the perimeter too, not worried that we would set the mountain on fire as long as it got us out of this nightmare. The underbrush in front of me did catch fire. It was a slow burn at first, then blazed up suddenly, revealing Jenny's corpse. It was tethered to a large tree trunk by vines that seemed to recoil from the fire. Her head flopped to the side, her dead eyes locking with mine. She whispered, You're next. The flames stretched, reaching for her, and set fire to her clothes. Now I turned and ran. I ran past Rick and into the darkness beyond, bouncing off trees, tripping, sliding down hills, Scrambling up hills, I ran and spotted a low fire ahead. I ran towards it, screaming wildly for help, and I ran right back into the nightmarish campsite, and upon seeing it, I kept going. I would run until I dropped. I had to get away. Just before sunrise, when the world takes on that ethereal glow and the fog is lifting, I heard heavy footsteps running toward me. I couldn't see anything behind me. The laughter echoed far up the mountain. My running had slowed to a fast walk, and I could see that I was in a different part of the woods. Had I finally made it away from that campsite, and barely able to put one foot in front of the other, I dragged on through the thick undergrowth and began to hear voices and the distortion of walkie-talkies and the occasional baying of a hound people. I was saved. Leaning against a tree for support, I tried to yell for help, but I was too weak. 
The sound came out sounding like a series of breathy squeaks. At the top of a little hill, I lost balance and tumbled down, rolling to a stop at the edge of a campsite. Strangers in uniforms and bright orange and yellow vests immediately surrounded me, and struggling to sit up with their help, I saw where I was and I wailed. It was the campsite. A hot, throbbing pain ripped through my right side and I crumpled over, holding it. Rick's dead eyes stared at me from two feet away. I couldn't see how he had died, but he was there, beside the fire pit. It looked like he'd been shot. A man's voice boomed by my ear. I flinched. Was he talking about me? The man pulled my hands from my side. I was covered in blood and the wound was the same as the one in Jenny's chest. Two men moved me and I could see that Rick was covered in little bloody spots. I asked what had happened to him and the man tending to my wounds said that he had been stabbed several times. They carried me out of the camp and I glimpsed at the charred remains of Jenny's body as they zipped her up in a body bag. Further down the trail there was another group of men covering Kathy's badly bludgeoned body with a blanket. The trail ascended steeply, and the men had trouble keeping me in the stretcher level. They struggled for what seemed like an hour before hitting more manageable terrain. I had no memory of going downhill for so long while I was running, or while my friends and I hiked. At the hospital, I woke up to a sterile, blindingly white room. My wrist was cuffed to the bed rail, and my side hurt like someone had stuck a hot poker through it. A nurse came to the door, scowled at me, turned and walked away, even as I was yelling for her to tell me what was going on. And a moment later, a detective entered. He held up a plastic evidence baggie, and in it was my pocket knife, covered with blood. All these years later, they still don't believe me. They still think I killed all of my friends, and that Rick shot me in self-defense. And now I'm a permanent resident of Shady Lane Psychiatric Hospital for the criminally insane. Just to be honest, I don't know what happened on that mountain. No matter where the evidence points... I did not kill my friends. It was whatever force is in that valley and on the mountain beyond.